Bibles, Luke chapter 3 is where I would uh, ask you to turn. Luke chapter 3. You know, people don't show up at the house at the front door uh, quite as commonly as they used to, and I, for one, I'm pretty happy about that because I don't know what it's like in your house, but in our house, um, our dogs think everything that comes to the door is a threat, like the mailman is their mortal enemy, and so anytime somebody knocks on the door or drops a package off, it could be just a squirrel that's like playing on the porch. Our dogs go crazy, and so they're barking, they're running around the house, but when somebody shows up, it kind of like makes your heart skip a beat, right? We don't, we don't notice it as much. We don't see it as much in our time as we used to. So our heart skips a beat, and we're surprised a little bit, and we're thinking, looking around at the house like, I hadn't cleaned. Uh, why are there fur balls over there under the table? And somebody sweep up this mess before I open the door, and that person's out there waiting five or ten minutes before you finally let them in their house. And then, like Jeff Foxworthy used to say, they come in, and you apologize and say, excuse the mess, the house is a mess, when really, really it's as clean as it's been in five or six years. Excuse the house. It's a mess. Hey, look, I don't know about your house, but I know in my house, we keep a, a clean house as best we can, but sometimes there are messes. We have dogs. Uh, we got kids, and sometimes dogs and kids make a mess. And so sometimes there's a mess in the house for good reason. Sometimes the people that live in the house or the animals that live in the house, they make a mess. But I tell you what, I'd much rather have a house that's a mess because people live there than one that's always spotless because nobody's home. And so sometimes the house is a mess, and there's good reason for that. We're family. Families make messes. But sometimes families are messes. The house is a mess sometimes. And I'm not talking about the house is a mess, the four walls and the roof and the floors and the dust on the table or anything like that. I'm talking about mom and dad. Sometimes we're a mess. Mom and dad, sometimes we, we're either screaming at each other or we're silent towards each other, and the house is a mess sometimes. And Grandpa was a drunk, and we hadn't seen Uncle Joe in a long time, and Cousin Eddie stops by, and it's just a mess sometimes. The house is a mess sometimes. And you know that, and I know that. And sometimes we hide it, and we act like, no, the house is perfectly clean. It's always clean. The house is a mess. And maybe we need to stop trying to cover it up. Maybe it's okay to say the house is a mess, the family is a mess. We got branches on the family tree that are a mess, and twisted and crooked sometimes, and sometimes it's okay to say that. Don't go in the closet. Neck deep in skeletons in there. The house is a mess. And I think we need to be okay with saying that. And I think the only way that we can be okay with saying that is by looking at other families whose house is a mess. If you got your Bible in Luke chapter 23, you're going to start reading there. Actually, you're probably not going to start reading there. But the passage that I want you to look at is in Luke chapter 3, starting at verse 23. It's the family tree, the house of Jesus. What a great day at church. We get the budget and the begats. Aren't you glad you came to church today? <laughs> uh, I've never preached on the, the begats, the genealogy, and when Ryan asked me what, sir, or what scripture he should read, I said, well, it's the genealogy of Jesus. Have fun. But we skipped it. We skipped that one. But this is the family line of Jesus. This is the house of Jesus. And I think it's interesting whenever you start looking through this that that there are broken walls in the house of Jesus. There are dusty floors in the house of Jesus. There are things that are broken along the way. Uh, splintered families, broken relationships, destroyed families are in the life and the family and the house of Jesus. And sometimes we just kind of gloss over it and act like everything's a, a Bible superhero. But that's just not the case at all. There are some famous folks there. I mean, there's Adam and there's Abraham and there's Noah and a lot of folks who did a lot of great things and they're famous for it. But there are also some infamous people there. I mean, there's the Jacobs who are the deceivers, and there's the, the, the David who's kind of the adulterer in the group there. And nobody wants to talk about that part of his life. But there are famous people, and there are infamous people there. There are people who did great things, and there are people who did awful things in the life of Jesus. We're going to talk about those for a few minutes. There are people who are really well-known in our worlds, the Abrahams and the Isaacs and the Jacobs and the Davids, and there are people in this list that you've never heard of unless you have read this list in Luke chapter 3. There are 77 names, and about 38 of them show up nowhere else in the entire Bible. And so Jesus came from a lot of famous people, and Jesus came from a lot of infamous people. Jesus came from a lot of well-known people, and Jesus came from a lot of people that you and I have never heard of today in 2023. Jesus came from a long list of a lot of people who did some great things and some awful things, and some of them are no names, and some of them are famous throughout all the years. And here they all are included in the family of Jesus, in the house of Jesus. 
was a mess. And the more you think about it, the more that mess in the house of Jesus really may feel like home. You don't get very far in the genealogy, and I promise you we're not going to read all the names. There's 77 of them, and I don't want to try to do that in front of people, to be honest with you. So we will read some of them. Luke 3, 23, Jesus is beginning his public ministry. He's about 30 years old. And look at what he says here. Being the son, as it was supposed, of Joseph. Jesus, of course, was born to the Virgin Mary. But in Luke's words, there's a supposing that's going on here, right? What a story in early Palestine days. For people to hear about this, this family, they're not even married. Joseph and Mary, not even married. They're betrothed. And now they got this, this woman who's, who's pregnant, and there had to be a bit of shame involved there, right? And I'm sure the townsfolk are whispering about it, right? You can hear the whispers. I'm sure Joseph heard the whispers. I'm sure people approached him and said, Joseph, really, man, tell me what's going on here. And Joseph says, no, I promise you, we didn't do that. It's a virgin birth, the immaculate conception. Of course I believe her, Joseph would say. But the rumors swirl, not to mention the couple is below the poverty line of Israel during that day. Uh, when it comes time to dedicate the baby Jesus in the temple, they can't even uh, afford to provide the prescribed sacrifices, and so they just have to sacrifice a couple of turtle doves. The town whispers about the scandal in the Joseph home. They're playing it off like that baby's his. Can't even afford that thing. Why would they have that baby? Whispers, rumors, the house is a mess, poverty. Skeptical looks that feel like home to you. You go back a few generations, and I promise you we're not going to go through all of them, but then eventually you come to a very well-known figure in Scripture, great King David. I mean, David's got this great story in his life. He's a man after God's own heart at a, per, a, a certain time in his life. We've heard the stories and the songs about how Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his ten thousands, but what we really know about David is the darker side. What we really think sometimes about David is more about his escapades in the bedroom than his exploits on the battlefield. In fact, when all the kings are going out to war, you don't find David out in the battlefield. You don't find him going to war. In 2 Samuel, you find David sitting at home. And he's not just sitting at home in his living room. He's sitting at home on his roof. And he looks out over the rooftop, and he sees somebody else that happens to be out on her rooftop, and her name is Bathsheba. And so David looks out there, he's king, all the other kings are gone to war, the military men have gone to war, but David's not there. This is getting to be a pretty dark story. He looks out and he sees Bathsheba taking a bath, and he says, I want her to come to my house. She's another man's wife. Well, doesn't matter, I want her to come to my house. She's taken, doesn't matter, I want her to come to my house. You should be at war, you shouldn't be here. You're really making a long line of mistakes here, David. Doesn't matter, I want her to come to my house. And so she comes to his house, and before you know it, another man's wife is having a baby sexual sin, adultery. There's a whole line of cover-ups so that nobody knows what's going on in that family line. And so when you think about the people of David, the, t the people are, are whispering again, man, We're talking about it. We all know it's true, right? We, we know what really happened with David. He's the king, should have been at war, but he invited her over to his house, can't control his eyes, can't control his body, covering it all up, but we can't say anything because he's the king. Lies, sexual sin, deception, cover-ups. The house is a mess. David's house is a mess. Feels like home to some of us in this room. You go back a little bit more, and you're going to find a man named Judah. Now, we may recognize the name Judah. He's in the line of Jesus here. He goes uh, several centuries back from David, but out of the line of Judah comes David and comes Jesus. Jesus will be referred to at some point as the Lion of Judah, which makes us think what a great man Judah must have been for Jesus to come out of his line. And not Joseph or somebody like that comes out of Judah. But what you really start to figure out about Judah is he's got a good name and a good reputation today, but his story is very dark. You may remember that Joseph, one of Judah's brothers, was sold into slavery by his brothers. Well, that was actually after they decided, let's kill him because we hate him so much, let's kill him. But eventually they say, no, nah, let's put him in the pit and see what, what else we can do with him. Judah is the one who gets the idea to say, well, there's, some, there's a caravan here heading down to Egypt. We could sell our brother, make a little profit on him, and we could benefit on this, and he's out of our hair anyway. And so Judah, not just one of the brothers that sold Joseph into slavery, Judah is the ringleader of the group in Genesis chapter 37. He's the chief slave trader in his family, which is not a great designation that you want to have. 
That's Genesis 37. If you go to chapter 38, there's the story about Judah and Tamar, which I'm not even going to go into that one today, but he seems to have had a certain affinity for women of the night. It's a very dark story. Slave trader. Illicit sexual encounters. And this is the man whose family is going to bring about Jesus into this world. The house is a mess. Family's a mess. It's in ruins. It's devastated. Does it feel like home? Well, maybe he got it honest because his dad was named Jacob, and Jacob is lovingly remembered as the father of the 12 tribes, right? Oh, yeah, he's the one who has all these sons, and all these sons are, are building great families, and one of them is going to be uh, father of Jesus. But Jacob's story is not one of, I built a great family. Jacob's story is one of deception over and over again. From the time that he's born, he's trying to deceive his brother Esau. And from the time that he can talk, he's trying to deceive his father, and he gets his mother on his side, and so he's playing the game of lies and deception. He's playing the game of, of pitting one family member against the other family member. Does that sound like your family? Do those things happen in your walls, in your house? Is the house a mess? And maybe even worse, when you think about Jacob, he's the deceiver, but you know he's got to get married at some point, and so he settles on a wife, and he works seven years for that wife, but lo and behold, it wasn't the wife that he wanted. And so by the time he gets married, he wakes up uh, the day after his wedding day and figures out, this is not what I wanted. I want somebody else. And so he just goes and finds another woman to marry. Hates his former wife and goes and marries another girl. Man, what a guy to be in the family line of Jesus, in the house of Jesus. This man who's known by deception, he reached the top by stepping on anybody that he had to on Jacob's ladder to get to the top. Marries a rich girl, decides he doesn't want her, marries her sister, Another rich girl that thinks he's going to make his way to the top has a bunch of kids, but clearly loves Joseph more than all the others, creates all kinds of family problems. The house is a mess. Deception, selfishness, sexual sin, again. Does it feel like home? And then there's his dad, Isaac. Isaac, you know they say ignorance is bliss and, and better off not knowing something like that, but Isaac was pretty ignorant. And it's proof that it leads to a lot of problems. He fell, Isaac fell for his own son Jacob's lies. He fell for his own wife's cover-up. How in the world can animal skin feel like human skin in the first place? Doesn't make any sense. But old naive Isaac fell for it and, and gave the blessing that was promised to one son to another son. He is a fool. He seems like he's past his prime. He's a threat to himself. He's a threat to all the people around him. The house is a mess with the bad choices, the family fights, Division in his own family. What kind of leader is he? What kind of man is he? I feel like home. There's Abraham. Got to have something positive to say about Abraham, right? He's in the line of Jesus. He's the father of the faithful and things like that. Well, true. Of course, he's the father of a nation. God chose him. And Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. He believes that, that God's going to bring this promise to fulfillment for him. But along the way, lies, lies. And then there was that time where he literally gave his wife away to save himself. I said there was that one time, but it was actually those two times that Abraham gave his wife away so that he would not be killed. Abraham seems to be that guy sometimes who will do anything to anybody as long as it helps him in the end. The house is a mess. Starting to feel like home. Not to mention Abraham's dad named Terah. We don't know a whole lot about him except he was most likely not a Christian, wasn't even a godly man, pretty much an idolater in his life. And you feel sorry for Abraham growing up in a family like that. House is a mess. Noah's in the house. Noah's idolized by Sunday schools everywhere. We talk about his boat. We talk about his righteousness and his faithfulness. He, he builds this big boat over a hundred boats over a hundred year period. He gets on, he saves eight souls, his family. Gotta be a good guy, right? Well, he gets off the boat, he plants a vineyard, gets drunk on the grape juice, and then something about his family uncovers his nakedness that's open to interpretation, but it ain't good. Never thought anything like that would happen to a guy like him. You never thought that scandal like that would emerge from a family like theirs. The house is a mess. I feel like home. And you go all the way back to Adam. That's where Luke's genealogy finally gets us to. And Adam is the first in a long, long, long line of sinners. He had it all, everything that we ever wanted. Peace and harmony 
everything that he ever wanted to eat. He had a wife and he had children and he stands tall at the front of a long line of sinners like you and like me. What do you do with Adam? Can't even control his own house. Can't even control his own family. Makes terrible choices. Ruins it all for all of us. The house is a mess. Any point you jump into in the genealogy of Jesus in Luke chapter 3, the house is a mess. Still home. From Joseph all the way back to Adam, the family of Jesus is a really, really messed up group. Now we lift them up in Sunday school and we celebrate them in our Bible classes. But I got to tell you, there's often a lot more to sweep under the rug than to celebrate in their lives. The house is a mess. From the one right before Jesus to the first one on this planet, the house was a mess. Does it feel like home to you? Does it hit too close to home for you? See, when we dress up and we clean up the house of Jesus, the people of Jesus, the family of Jesus, when we talk about David's exploits on the battlefield and we skip right over his escapades in the bedroom, we talk about Judah as the father of this family that eventually will bring forth Jesus, but we forget about his slave trading and his sexual immorality. When we lift up people like Abraham and talk about how faithful they are, but forget about how they literally try to give their wife away to save their own lives. When we dress them up, we church them up, we clean them up, and we make everybody this Christian superhero in Scripture, we get a faulty sense of what our lives are. We get a faulty sense of what our lives are supposed to be. When we overlook the mess in the house of Jesus, we start to think that I need to cover up my own mess in my own house. And so that leads to us coming into a room like this on a day like this every Sunday. How you doing? I'm doing great. How you doing? Doing good too. Living the dream. Life is bliss. Everything is good. We smile. We're happy. And we go home in silence. And we go home in fighting. And we go home to our families, our houses that are a mess. We don't like to talk about the skeletons in the family hall closet, but they're there. Jesus never once hides the skeletons in his family's closet. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but the only person in history from beginning of time, Adam, till right now in 2023, the only one in history who could pick out his family tree like a Christmas tree was Jesus. And the family tree that he chose was a house that is an absolute mess. And so maybe you come from a messed up family. Maybe you are living in a messed up family right now. And there are skeletons in the closet, so much so that you don't open the door because they fall out and they'll just cover you up. You, you got things in your family that are true and you wish that they were not true. You got things in your family that you wish you did not have to avoid at holiday dinners. You got things in your family that make a sermon like this a little bit too uncomfortable for you. It hits too close to home. You're well acquainted with the skeletons in the hall closet, whether they're skeletons of lust or skeletons of sexual sin, the skeletons in the closet of lies and shame, the greed, the destructive habits, the trauma that you're still trying to overcome, the addictions to who in the world knows what family member you don't agree with, the one who has wrecked it all, the house, may very well be a mess. And you're wondering, because we've cleaned up the stories, you know, we'll talk about the good of Noah, but not the bad. We're talking about the good choices they made, and we'll make them the all-stars of the Bible. We don't talk about their bad choices, and we think, man, those guys were so good. How could I ever live up to an Abraham or a David? Or how could I ever live up to Joseph and Mary? Or how could I ever live up to this or that? How could I ever live up to the pictures that have been painted for me of the Bible superheroes from the time I was a kid? And you wonder, am I good enough? Why would God want somebody like me and use somebody like me and even rescue somebody like me? How could I be good enough? With a messed up family like this. Well, I got to tell you this morning that Jesus was born into that kind of family, and he was born into that kind of family to deal with families like ours. He comes to welcome us as children into God's family, to adopt us into the family of God, and he calls us, messed up families as we are, brother and sister, no matter how much of a mess the house is in. For those who have been baptized into Christ, 
We are family. And I want you to know that family messes are included with families. Nobody ever supposed, nobody ever thought, we should never teach or anything like that, that the minute that somebody is baptized into Christ and they become a Christian, that everything's going to be great and everything's going to be grand. There will be no more messes in the house, no more spills in the floor, no more hairballs under the table. We're going to have messes. We're going to have some skeletons in the closet. We're going to mess up. We're going to make mistakes. Everybody has except for Jesus. He chose to be born into a family full of sinners and saints and sometimes scoundrels. He chose that life. And as we become part of his family, our messes are included in that. But as we become a part of his family, as we're baptized into Christ, there are no more distinctions. There's no more separating the good from the bad and the righteous and the evil. The sins are gone and new life has begun. We're still going to make some messes. We're still going to have to do some cleanup jobs in our own lives, but we are cleansed. For those who are not baptized into Christ right now, I got to tell you, the house may still be a mess. Still be a wreck, but it's not too bad to start the cleanup process. And I want to ask you if today may be a good time to start that cleaning up process. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. This is the verse that Ryan read for us just a few minutes ago. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Uh, This is Jesus to a family, a group of Christians just messed up people. I mean, messed up in life, messed up in their thoughts, going down wrong roads, destructive choices and habits. They have this idea that they don't have any family messes in Laodicea. And they say, uh, you know, we don't have any need of really anything. We are good. And Jesus says, don't you know that you're blind and you're lame and you're sick and you're ill and you really do need some help? He says, I wish that you were hot or cold, but you're not. You're just kind of somewhere in the middle, not really useful for a whole lot. You're just lukewarm. You can't cool anything off. You can't warm anybody up. You're just kind of there. But in Revelation 3.20, supper time. Revelation 3.20, it's feast time. It smells like bread and wine at the door. The house is a mess. Laodiceans are a mess. The people that live in that house, they're a mess. Everybody's a mess. The house is a mess. Feels like home to us, probably. But it's a mess. And Jesus knows it. But he's there at that house, and there's a knock. And he says, behold, I stand at the door, and I knock. If you'll let me in, I want to come in, and I want to sit down at your table. Sometimes there's a mess at the table. Stacks of bills. Stacks of who knows what a mess but he stands at the door and he knocks and he says I want to come and I want to sit at your messy table in your dining room that may be messy I'm okay with walking through the messy hall I know the skeletons that are in the hall closet I'm, I'm there I got you the house is a mess and he knows it and he still stands at the door and he knocks and the question is will we open house is a mess. The dogs are going crazy. There's a hairball under the table still. Nobody's cleaned up the mess in the floor yet. It's not good enough. I'm not good enough. He's got to walk right through the family hall closet, and he's going to see the skeletons that are inside there. He'll see the mistakes. He'll see the sin, sexual sin, the greed sin. He'll see the pride sin, the deceptive sins, the hate sins, the lying sins, the gossip sin, the secret sin that nobody else knows about. The house is a mess, and I can't let him in because he'll see it. Can't let Jesus see that. Well, he already knows the mess. Spoiler. In fact, he came from a mess just like it, and he came to save us from ones just like it. He came to this world for the mess that the world is in. And in some kind of way, I got to believe it feels like home to him. He stands at the door and he knocks. Will we open I want you to know that if you do decide to open that door, you'll come to the table with Jesus and the rest of his family. And if you've ever read the story of Jesus, if you've ever read about his life, you'll see that he makes a habit of going to and welcoming the sinners and the scoundrels and the saints into his family. People like us, people like our messy families are the family of God. The house is a mess. 
but it's home. Stands at the door and knocks. Will we let him in? All together we stand and while we sing.